Good morning. Welcome to the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. My name is Svetlana Beckman, and I will be the moderator for today's program. Due to COVID-19, our programs are virtual for the time being. We want to keep everyone safe and healthy. And of course, we look forward to resuming our in-person gatherings as soon as possible. For those who are new to the society, we are a self-governing, inclusive, caring community for those who seek a rational, compassionate philosophy of life without regard to belief or non-belief in a supreme being. We focus on the ethical values that bring people together, not on the beliefs that keep them apart. In the spirit of intellectual, philosophical, and artistic freedom, we come together to explore life, nature, and the universe. Like traditional religious communities, we celebrate births, conduct wedding ceremonies, and host memorial services. Through our Golden Rule Sunday School, we teach our kids humanist principles, religious literacy, and critical thinking. We staff soup kitchens, pack lunches for the homeless, watch movies, and write fiction. And many of these activities, including the Sunday School, are still taking place, albeit virtually. After today's speaker concludes his presentation, the audience will be invited to submit questions for the Q&A by typing them into the comments section. And now on to today's program. Our guest, John Fassman, is The Economist's US digital editor. Previously, John served as Washington correspondent, Southeast Asia bureau chief, and Atlanta correspondent, also for The Economist. He's also the author of two novels, The Geographer's Library and The Unpossessed City. He and his family live in New York. John's talk today is entitled Liberty and Justice in the Age of Perpetual Surveillance and is based on his recent book, We See It All, Liberty and Justice in an Age of Perpetual Surveillance. Our programs address a wide variety of topics, including current events, philosophy, arts, and sciences, to name just a few. And today's presentation is part of our ongoing programming relating to current events. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my book is called We See It All. This is what it looks like. I thought um, what I would do is speak briefly about uh, how I came to write the book, what the book deals with, and then read a short section from it. Um, I've done a number of these events and, and, and facial recognition is probably, of all the technologies that I talk about, facial recognition comes up most often. So I'm gonna read a short section about how facial recognition works in the hopes this might, this might lead to a, to a more productive discussion. So the book grew out of a series of articles I wrote for The Economist in 2018 that, that looked at how technology was changing the criminal justice system. Um, I began as a journalist, as a, as a police reporter back in the, in the late 90s in Washington, DC. I've always had an interest in crime and policing and civil liberties. I think that this is an area where as a society, we get a lot wrong at great cost. Um, and we, in doing so, we often, we often violate our, our core principles to the individual and violate our core constitutional promises. So this book sort of grew out of this, this series of, 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 I think, seven articles. Um, the book looks at a number of different technologies, um, body cameras, cell phone cameras to look at police, um, encryption crackers on cell phones or how police can, can peer into your cell phones, facial recognition, drones, um, electronic monitoring, uh, and algorithms around sentencing and police allocation. Um, and early on in my reporting, I spoke with a, with a woman named Catherine Crump at Berkeley Law School. And she asked the question that led to this book, which is, she basically said to me, look, the technology that we deploy here and that China deploys are not different. China's surveillance state is much more expansive than ours is but it's really no more technologically advanced, doesn't rely on sort of some sort of special machine that they have that we don't. So the question we need to ask ourselves, she said this to me, the question we need to ask ourselves is what democratic practices do we need to not become China? And what that means is not, you know, how do we stop our government from turning as malevolent and as hostile to civil liberties 
and individual rights as China's is. And I don't think that's going to happen overnight. But what could happen, what I think is happening without our realizing it, is that we are building out this surveillance state, not through malice or through a desire to repress citizens, but through sort of trust in police and through complacency. And I worry that we will have this surveillance architecture in place that nobody really wanted because we didn't speak up in defense of the principles of civil rights, individual liberty, um, the right to not be tracked everywhere you go, the right to not be surveilled if you're not suspected of a crime, the right to know what the state is doing with your data, the right to know how the state stores your data and who has access to it. So the book is not an anti-technology book. I don't think, I, I think that technology has changed all of our lives. And I think that as more of our lives have moved online, police need and should have access to technologies that let them do their job. But we also as citizens who are policed should know what those technologies do and how police use them and what they do with our data and how they store it and who gets to see it. And we should have audits to make sure that they're doing what they say they're going to do. In effect, it's a pro-regulation book. It's no different than, than there's no other sector, I should say, where, I think that's right, there's no other sector of our economy, of our society, where we essentially entrust people to do the right thing without regulation. I mean, we trust our banking systems, but we still want banks regulated. It's the same thing we, with police. Those regulations aren't there now. So that's what this book is fundamentally about. It's an argument in favor of citizens taking charge and, and, and demanding more say in how they're policed, and really just demanding that their regulations set up around these technologies that have allowed police and can allow police to amass a really granular portrait of our lives. Now I'm gonna talk about facial recognition now because it has been in the news recently. Um, and we can talk about that in the, in the discussion section. It was used or police say it was used to capture some of the insurrectionists who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Um, and to my mind, there's no technology I wrote about that poses more danger than this. We can leave a cell phone at home. We don't have to take cars. So we won't be subject to automatic license plate readers. But anytime we leave our house, we bring our face with us. And I believe we really do have a right to be anonymous and public and a right to go about our daily lives without, worry that we're, without worrying that we're being tracked by the state everywhere we go. And that's what facial recognition enables. And that's why I think it's crucial to speak up about it right now. So what I'm going to do is read you a short section that effectively explains sort of how facial recognition works and what, what the dangers are. And then after that, I hope I'll be able to after that, I'll be able to take your questions, and, uh, and I hope we'll have a productive and interesting discussion. So. This is from a chapter called The End of Anonymity, which looks at facial recognition. Facial recognition systems determine probabilities, not certainties. And operators of these systems need to determine what level of probability they are comfortable with. Set the bar too high and the system will produce a lot of false negatives. It will miss people who are in the database. Set it too low, and it will produce a lot of false positives. It will see likely matches where none exists. Or in policing terms, set it too high, and the suspect will not be identified. Set it too low, and innocent people will be bothered and possibly arrested. This problem is not exclusive to facial recognition. Television shows like CSI paint biometrics and forensic science as practically infallible, these TV detectives talk about finding a fingerprint or other biometric match, when in the real world, such evidence is far less certain. It usually points to probable matches at best rather than towards certainty. And sometimes biometrics fail. Consider, for instance, the aftermath of the Madrid train bombing in 2004. On March 11th of that year, terrorists detonated several bombs on commuter trains that killed around 200 people and injured another 1,400. Eight days later, the FBI identified a fingerprint on a recovered bag of detonators as belonging to Brandon Mayfield. Mayfield was a lawyer in Oregon. Investigators found no links between him and the attacks. Nonetheless, Mayfield was put under covert surveillance and his home and office were searched. He was arrested on May 6th and detained as a material witness for two weeks, despite, again, his lack of connection to the attacks. And even more alarmingly, despite the Spanish National Police having told the FBI nearly a month earlier that the fingerprint did not in fact belong to Mayfield. Not until the Spanish police publicly revealed that the fingerprint belonged to an Algerian national was Mayfield released. He ultimately won a public apology and a $2 million settlement from the federal government. 
Or consider also the well-earned discrediting of other quasi-biometric sources of data, such as bite mark analysis. Often presented at trials as forensically accurate, in, fi in fact, bite mark analysis is wholly unscientific. It's just a person making an observed judgment. Bite marks shift and change when left on skin. They can be distorted by the skin's elasticity or shift over time as the victim's skin swells, heals, or decays. Yet it has put people in prison, often incorrectly. Bad bite mark evidence has led to multiple exonerations. But where does facial recognition fall on the biometric spectrum? Excuse me. Where does facial recognition fall on the biometric spectrum, which stretches from DNA analysis, which is fairly reliable given an adequate sample and proper interpretation, to bite mark analysis, wholly subjective and without scientific backing? How good is facial recognition at recognizing the right faces? Answering that question is difficult, not least because every facial recognition algorithm is difficult, is different. In that sense, asking whether facial recognition is accurate is a bit like asking whether cars are fast. Some are and some aren't. Some have higher top speeds than others. Some run smoothly at high speeds and some rattle and shake on highways. A Lamborghini can reach higher speeds and reach moderate speeds faster than my trusty old Subaru. Some cars are generally faster than others, but almost all of them will get you where you want to go faster than if you walked, just as all facial recognition algorithms are intended to recognize faces. In testimony to the House Oversight Committee, Kimberly Del Greco, who was then Deputy Director of the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Divi Division, said that the system her agents used at that time returns the correct candidate a minimum of 85% of the time within the top 50 candidates. That's not exactly a foolproof match. And it raises a question for trials. If a person is arrested based on the lead generated by a facial recognition algorithm that ranked him the 45th most likely match of 50, how should a defense attorney use and how should a judge and jury weigh that information? Generally, police say that facial recognition is used to generate leads, not proof. Presumably, police and prosecutors will say that in this case, the lead came from the 45th, the lead that came from the 45th person panned out while the first 44 did not. And it shouldn't matter where someone ranked as long as the police arrested the right person. But that contradicts testaments to the technology's effectiveness. In July, 2018, the ACLU of Northern California built a facial recognition database using publicly available mugshots and recognition, Amazon's deep learning facial recognition software. Used by police departments and large corporations, it is part of Amazon Web Services push into the surveillance market. The ACLU ran every current member of Congress through the database using Amazon's default settings. The database misidentified 20 members of Congress as RSDs, including a disproportionate share of non-white representatives. That included John Lewis, a hero of the civil rights movement who represented part of Atlanta from 1987 until his death in July 2020, and Luis Gutierrez, who represented parts of Chicago for 26 years. Matt Wood, Amazon's vice president of AI, pushed back on the ACLU's experiment, claiming that it used recognition's default confidence threshold of 80%, not the 99% confidence level it recommends for law enforcement use. Moreover, recognition, he said, it's constantly improving. Twice he pointed out in one brief post that recognition has been used to fight human trafficking, though he never says precisely how. But anything can be useful in one case, but anything can be harmful in one case and helpful in others. Surface-to-air missiles have helped win wars. That doesn't mean my neighbor needs one. They would be far less productive in solving minor lawn care disputes. The ACLU is just one of many studies and experiments that have found racial and gender bias in facial recognition algorithms. Sometimes those biases emerge without studies. In 2015, Google's consumer-facing facial recognition app misidentified two African Americans as gorillas. In early 2018, Joy Bolamwini then a doctoral student at, the Mass at MIT, and Tim Gebru, then an AI research scientist at Google, published a paper analyzing how well the three leading, leading facial recognition algorithms, which were then IBM's, Microsoft's, and Negvi's, identified genders across races. They found that the error rates of all three were roughly 2.5 times, times as high when identifying women than men, and nearly twice as high for darker skin than lighter skin faces all performed at their worst when trying to identify the faces of darker-skinned women. Precisely why these algorithms perform worse at these tasks is not clear, but it may have something to do with the data sets on which they were trained. If these sets contain more men than women and more white people than non-white people, then the algorithm may perform best with the most familiar characteristics. 
This suggests that facial recognition, race, and gender bias might be ameliorated by training algorithms using a more diverse set of faces. IBM, at least, seems to believe that theory may be true. In early 2019, it released a data set of 1 million diverse faces annotated in 10 different ways to give facial recognition algorithms a stronger starting point. In response to Borlamini's finding, Microsoft, according to the New York Times, said it was investing in research to recognize, understand, and remove bias. Microsoft, like Amazon and IBM, has called on the government to regulate facial recognition. Although with Congress as dysfunctional as it is, that amounts to little more than virtue signaling. In aggregate, the algorithms appear to be improving. The National Institute of Standards and Technologies, a non-regulatory government standards agency in the Department of Commerce, has performed regular tests on commercially available fa facial recognition algorithms. In 2018, it evaluated 127 algorithms from 39 different developers, finding that they were collectively 20 times more accurate than in 2014. The report attributes the improvement to the rise to the use of convolutional neural networks. Facial recognition, the report said, has undergone an industrial revolution with algorithms increasingly tolerant of poor quality images. In other words, as facial recognition improves, so does its ability to accurately identify people from imperfect pictures. The days of us having to stand still and stare directly into a camera in order to be recognized may soon seem as outdated as having to remain still for a daguerreotype. But aggregate improvements can still mask micro-level differences. Just because facial recognition has grown more accurate does not mean that all algorithms perform equally well on all races and genders. An evaluation that NIST released, that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, released in December 2019, found that across 189 commercially available algorithms from 99 firms, systems fared no worse identifying African and Eastern people than they did in identifying Europeans. But that was not the case for algorithms developed in China which displayed low false positive rates for East Asians, suggesting that training networks on a broad array of faces could help ameliorate the racial false identification gap. Still, some systems will perform better than others, and without adequate benchmarks and policy guardrails, nothing compels police forces to choose a less biased algorithm if, for instance, it is more expensive than one that performed worse. And even as facial recognition algorithms grow more accurate across all demographics, they can still be used in a biased way. For instance, by being deployed, as some agencies currently deploy patrol forces, disproportionately in non-white neighborhoods. An algorithm that successfully identifies 99.8% of all the faces it sees, but is mostly used to identify black and brown people, becomes just another tool to perpetuate racial bias. As with any other technology that is used the wrong way, facial recognition risks calcifying rather than ameliorating society's biases. That statement, that statement raises a crucial question. What is the right way to use facial recognition? Uh, that's where I'd like to end. I'd be happy to take questions, talk, whenever you like. Great, thank you. Much food for thought. We will have, obviously, we have tons of time for Q&A, which is great, so start thinking about questions. Um, in the meanwhile, oh, and start typing them into the chat box. In the meanwhile, we will listen to a brief musical interlude, look at a slideshow of past um, society programs, and collect donations. Contributions will be collected virtually at ethicalhumanistsociety.org slash donate, or with Zell to donate at ethicalhuman.org. We suggest a donation of $5, and of course, appreciate any amount that you're comfortable with. It is through our generosity that we show how meaningful the Sunday programs are, and we thank everyone who sustains the society with their donations of time and money.
Great. Welcome back. We are now going to commence with our questions. And the first one is, where and how is facial recognition used most often by law enforcement? So I think, right, currently. Currently. Mm -hmm. uh, so the how is a good question. A number of forces use, there, there, there are a couple of ways traditionally that police have used facial recognition, and that is when they see a picture of a suspect usually caught on surveillance cameras, on CCTV cameras, they'll compare it to a database usually comprised of pictures either uh, from mugshots, so of previous RSDs, or of driver's licenses, which is much more expansive. Now, the more worrying use of facial recognition that has emerged recently is this from a service called Clearview, which was used in the wake of the, of the January 6th riots. And Clearview differs from other facial recognition services in that its database is comprised of billions of pictures scraped from the internet often against, often from Facebook and social media sites, often against the terms of service of those sites. Um, and in that case, what's even more worrying than that is that Clearview often has, has it, it appears that individual police officers have been offered Clearview contracts uh, to run searches on their phones independent of any order from police force just on their own. So, you know, that there is, I think there is a way to use facial recognition well by police force. I think there's a recent law the recent law in Massachusetts is, is a model piece of legislation. It says the police can run searches with a judicial with judicial approval, and they can't do it themselves. So they have to have someone at the DMV actually run the searches for them. So that prevents them from using it sort of surreptitiously or in a malicious manner. I, I would love to see more, you know, more more legislation like that. Um, but most police forces right now, I think, still use the traditional sort of when they're using it officially, still use the traditional database of, of mug shots or, 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 or driver's license pictures. It's interesting, I mean, just to follow up on that without going to the official questions, um, you know, can a cop, you know, like, for instance, after that particular uh, insurrection, the, the police were looking for tips, right? Mm -hmm. The insurrectionists posted their photos all over social media, mm -hmm. and so, private citizens, right, would do those searches, that yes. means just their own searches, right, and then report to the police. So that's perfectly copacetic, I assume. I think so. But is different from the police essentially, well, I don't know, I, I guess that those are the lines that we're going to have to draw, right? What exactly is the difference between that and the shortcut, effectively, that you just described, that clear view uh, arguably is, is presenting the police. I think the shortcut in that one specific example may be absolutely fine, but I think we need to ask ourselves a couple of things. Number one, I haven't seen, and I haven't been able to find out exactly how many people they caught through facial recognition, as opposed to using just the traditional investigative methods, you know, of, of questioning people, pressing them, getting them to tell them things. I mean, so many people were caught through social media that it's, it's hard for me to believe that they wouldn't have gotten more people had they just questioned them and gotten them to identify themselves. It might have taken longer. The other question is, and I think this applies to all forms of surveillance technology, is that the efficacy of the technology cannot be the end of the question, right? All of these technologies that I write about, all of these technologies will help police solve some crimes, at least sort of at the margin, right? But there are all kinds of things that could help police solve crimes that are just incompatible with life in an open liberal democracy, right? Getting rid of habeas corpus, indefinite detention without trial, facial recognition universal everywhere, tracking us everywhere, all these things would probably make it easier to catch people, but they're incompatible with the with what I think we want of a, in a democracy. And so you can't just ask whether they will help solve crimes. You've got to ask, do we want a world in which they are used without regulation, willy-nilly? Do we want a world in which we're monitored all the time? I gotcha. No, that's that's great. Yeah, that brings us back to sort of first principles. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question: Can laws, policies be written that can evolve as the technology evolves? Feels like this is one of those issues where we may be fighting last year's fight. Yeah, I think that's a great question, right? Because we are certainly, I think, you know, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence as it exists now, I think is still mostly an artifact of a time when 
the things we wanted to keep safe were locked in a physical cabinet at our house or in a bank vault where we talked on the phone over over landline wires. So I think, you know, it's it's we can say, we can talk about laws and technology. We can talk about sort of laws and policies that respond to specific tech. But one solution I found really inspiring is is in Oakland. So the story there begins in in January. 2014, I think, when the Edward Snowden revelations came out. Oakland was then thinking about deploying what's called a domain awareness system, which linked up a bunch of discrete tech inputs and sort of made a holistic monitoring system to, to keep their port safe. Because this happened as the Snowden revelations came out, as we learned just what the government was doing, there are a lot of concerned citizens who just started showing up at city council meetings and raising uncomfortable questions and demanding answers. What that turned into is a body called the Oakland Privacy Commission, which is attached to the city council. And their job is a group of nine citizens volunteering, concerned citizens doing their democratic duty. Um, and what they do is anytime the city wants to buy a new piece of police tech, they have to explain to the Privacy Commission why they want it, how they're going to use it, what policies are in place to make sure they use it the way they say they're gonna use it. There have to be penalties for misuse and there are independent audits. So that's the sort of body I would love to see set up everywhere, really. So you're not, as the questioner says, so you're not fighting last year's fight. So you're not wholly responsive. So you're proactive and you're evaluating tech as they come in. Which which suggests that maybe we can do the regulation at a local level, not necessarily. I mean, you, you said that Congress is dysfunctional, indeed, right? But maybe we don't need some sort of an overarching federal legislation. Maybe we can... Uh, deal with this on a more, I don't know, state, city, whatever, and best practices will sort of, um, will, will kind of get into the system and will be adopted. Right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, bear in mind, we have in this country, I think 13,600 some police forces, a few dozen of them are federal. So this fight has to be local and it has to be everywhere. And as you said, the advantage of doing that is that best practices will eventually sort of emerge and become, you know, if we don't have, I'm sure we'll start out with different standards everywhere, but the hope is that as more and more places try more and more things, there will be a set of best practices that emerges. All right. Um, let's see, lots of questions. All right, I know I'm probably taking up more of my prerogative here. Question, is there any evidence that people are being tracked by government agency for their political participation, i.e. Trump rallies, BLM demonstrations? Uh, I don't know. I just haven't reported on that, and I don't want to. It's it's a good question. I just haven't looked into it in the in the past few months. Okay. Is there a systematic way to think about false negatives and false positives differently in different domains, like here and in voting, say, when in realms then in realms where errors are less consequential? Hmm. Okay, systematic, well, maybe you understood the question. Uh, I'm not sure I did. I'm not sure I did. I'm okay, sorry. Let's see. Is there a systematic way to think about false negatives and false positives differently in different domains? So, for example, in the realm that you're uh, discussing versus perhaps voting where errors are less consequential, right? So, so somebody who's not eligible to vote votes less consequential than when somebody who's not guilty is or who didn't commit the offense is subjected to the judicial process. I think that's what um, the question I think is. So. I think so. I mean, one other way to think about it is that facial recognition is not used only for law enforcement purposes, right? So a, you know, a false positive, you are one of those people who uses facial recognition to board a plane, um, which I hope you all are not. I don't, and I'm happy to explain why in a minute. But but maybe a false positive in plane boarding is relatively inconsequential because you just get pulled out of line and show your ID, whereas a false positive in the sort of police context might subject you to harassment by police or 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 arrest. I guess it makes sense to think about you. You know, I think there's no question that the that that the plane boarding thing is less consequential. Um. But again, I think it's all sort of of a piece when it comes to this technology. It's all a question of even a false negative when you're boarding a plane, even using facial recognition to board a plane effectively normalizes that technology, right? Which is why I don't use it because I just fear that the more I choose to use it, the more it will be brought out and used in ways that, that I don't choose. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, are there laws regarding accessing private CCTV for law enforcement and vice versa? Can a home business owner request facial recognition be used to identify someone on security recording without filing a crime report? I'm not sure, but there are laws. So if you are a private, the, the police cannot order you to turn over surveillance footage without a warrant. They can ask you to do it, and most people comply. They can ask in a somewhat coercive manner, I'm sure. But they, when you know, I think if they ask a business owner, if they say to a business owner, a crime was committed on the street, you know, your camera has a great view. Will you share your footage? Most people will say yes, but they can't. They can't commission it. I think where that gets into a sort of slippery slope problem uh, is with things like ring doorbells. You know, those doorbells that have mm -hmm. a camera that pans outward. There are a number of cities where police will pay for the cost of installation, pay private, basically pay the cost of installing ring for private citizens with the expectation that uh, if they ask for footage, that citizen will then feel obligated to give it to them. There are also instances in which police have access to the neighbor's app, which is the ring app for, for a neighborhood, which gives them access to footage and sort of lets them know what's what's going on. But if you're a private business owner, the police can't can't demand that you that you turn over the footage. Okay. Having been to China recently and experiencing in minor ways the surveillance state, it's evident that they are in the lead. Are they exporting this technology for financial and political influence? Yes. Yes, unquestionably. So I wanted to go to China to report this book um for a number of reasons i couldn't i was sort of for a number of reasons i thought it would be better if i did not go i worried about putting people in danger who i who i spoke to i thought that uh i probably wouldn't wouldn't get much of 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 value i don't speak very good chinese but i did want to see the sort of chinese built the chinese built systems that they were exporting um so i went to ecuador and they have a chinese built system that is ostensibly designed and not it does do this not ostensibly that is primarily designed so they say to improve the response of emergency services so police fire and ambulance so it's a network of when i went a couple years ago it was 1200 cameras i think it's probably more than that now built out around the country that all feed into a central monitoring system where people can dispatch police fire and ambulance quickly they can monitor the situation that's all to the good right but it has a dual use purpose obviously in that it it is a central monitoring system of thousands of cameras around the world, around the country rather, that the government can use to monitor anything it wants. And maybe that's emergency services, but I spoke to an opposition politician who showed me the front door of his house that had a couple of cameras pointed right at it, another one pointed into the window of his daughter's bedroom, and a parabolic listening system that was that was aimed at his house as well. So they're exporting these, they're Chinese surveillance tech, they're exporting them all over the world and often with this dual use idea, with the idea that it will sort of make certain governmental systems function more efficiently, which everything want, which you know everyone should want, but can also be used to sort of to surreptitiously monitor people. Yeah, including uh, tracking and tracing for epidemic purposes, right? Right. I mean, that's you know that's a. I mean, I don't know to what extent facial recognition was used in China or in any other, uh, I guess, you know, the successes that some of the Asian countries that have been very successful, right? They yeah. certainly used, uh, I don't know if they used facial recognition, but I mean, can you speak to that? Can you speak to the extent to which the availability of those kinds of systems helped perhaps stem the spread of, of COVID most recently? Yeah. It's a thorny problem, isn't it, right? Because I think certainly in South Korea, the phone app was a huge success, right? Sort of most of the population had it. If someone went somewhere where there was a possibility they were exposed to COVID, they got an alert so they could test themselves and isolate if necessary. Um, New York has just uh, rolled out its Excelsior Pass, which is a basically a vaccine passport on your phone. Um, I haven't gotten my second shot yet, and I'm still of two minds about whether I want to put that on my phone, because I just, I know, you know, if it was the case that only public health officials had access to it, 
and law enforcement did not. And there were real penalties if law enforcement misused it. Then I would probably be comfortable downloading it. On the other hand, I also worry about 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 mission creep, right? If they can if they can do this during COVID, do we want it on our phones during flu season? If we don't have it, should insurers be able to charge us higher prices because we 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 are not taking as good care of our health, so they say, as other people who might have this installed in their phone would. So I do worry about that in that sense. Um, but I can't deny that 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 sort of test and trace, app-based, surveillance-based test and tracing seems to have corralled the epidemic pretty well in countries that have used it well. That's the thing. And none of these, none of these technologies mm -hmm. are, are there easy answers, right? It's not mm -hmm. a the, buy it, don't buy it, use it, don't use it. It's it's right. it's in every case, it's subtle and requires thought and probably requires constant conversation and rethought. Yes. Yes. Where do you feel surveillance systems like Shop Spotter? Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, Shot Spotter. Mm -hmm. This is detecting triangulating gunshots mm -hmm. with audio monitors fit into your model of police state monitoring. I'm glad I'm glad that asked that to have that question. I did I do write about Shot Spotter in this book and I've seen it used uh, I've seen it used in Newark and in St. Louis, and I've spent some time in the ShotSpotter headquarters. It's it's a promising technology. I think that the could you explain it? Could you? Yeah, could sorry. You... Yeah, of course. So basically, what it is 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 when I saw it used in Newark, it is a series of acoustic sensors. They look like uh, little diamonds uh, that are put on traffic lights and and telephone poles. And when they hear a loud sudden sound, I think it's 130 decibels or higher, something that may be a gunshot, an alert goes to ShotSpotter's headquarters in California. And you have an acoustic engineer who, who listens to it and then determines whether it is in fact a gunshot, or I think the most common other, other the most common mistaken sound is a, is a Jake break, you know, mechanical break for a truck that emits a sudden pop, pop, pop sound. Um, fireworks are pretty common. So anyway, when you get a, when the acoustical engineer determines that it is in fact a gunshot, the police get an alert. Gunshots heard, here's how many shots, here's where and when, and then they can go to that location because most gunshots that go off in American cities are not reported. It's often hard if they go off in an urban area, the sound bounces from building to building, it's hard to determine where it was initially. So this is designed to triangulate where it came from and when. Mm -hmm. um, when I saw it, so when I was embedded for a while with Newark's police department, we got a few shot spotter alerts and found no people at any time in any of them, no victims at any time. Now that could mean that, you know, someone was shooting out of a car and missed, could mean that often in illegal gun transactions on the street, people would do a test fire of a clip. So it could have been that, it could have been someone shooting into the air. Um, the one thing that I heard most often from people as I was reporting on shot spotter, and this is just ordinary people, cab drivers, bartenders, sort of kept people I struck up conversations with, is the certainty that it overhears conversations. Now, I don't think it does this deliberately. It does, it's trained to recognize very loud sudden sounds, and that's just not how people talk. But there have been a couple of cases brought in which the shot spotter, in which shot spotter is turned on and records the gunshots and then catches a bit of conversation on the tail end. So it's not as clear as, as, as the company says, it does not record private conversations. It doesn't as a matter of course, but it can. Um, I think for cities that have used ShotSpotter, that are thinking of ShotSpotter, they should consider, you know, is it really as effective as, as ShotSpotter says it is? Because if you have a city that has, you know, somewhere like Newark, Detroit, Baltimore, St. Louis, a huge city, that has lost population, you'll often have gunshots go off in a sort of remote area. Does ShotSpotter get you there in time? Would that money be better spent sort of on intel so you know who is shooting who and why and maybe can intervene first? Um, but I, I think it is a technology that's, that's, that's it's certainly being used more and more. A lot of police departments seem to think it has great promise. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of police departments, I mean, from your uh, interviews with people, uh, I mean, can you generalize about what law enforcement thinks about, uh, let's say, facial recognition? I mean, are they like, 
rah rah are they ambivalent like is there a uniform like do they just want whatever technology can you generalize at all about the attitude of law enforcement police specifically I mean, in my experience from the departments that i talk to there's a huge age split so people i mean i'm i'm 45 so i'd say officers who are my age and older and who maybe aren't digital natives are pretty suspicious of tech they mm -hmm. think and they're right that sort of shoe leather police work will solve more cases than tech. Younger guys are more at ease with the tech. They understand, I think, for the most part, that it's just one tool in a series of tools. Um, and so they're generally more favorably disposed toward it. Right. I think that, you know, I think that there's, 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 no, there's no general position, but I think that the police generally recognize it, tech, as just one of many tools. I think the chiefs, even if they're older, they tend to take cues from the younger guys and they recognize the, the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if there are benefits, the question is there's a there's then costs, right? So is it worth the tech in all cases? What tech is worth it and what isn't? I know that some cities have tried shot spotter and found that it that it wasn't worth the money. Um, other places set up facial recognition differently, but I think there is that split by age, but also an understanding that look, as more and more life moves online, as more and more sort of plotting and thinking and talking about crime is being done online, we need to have some way to be active there as police. And we're still sort of feeling out what that might be. Let's see. Are there going to be cases where this kind of technology will be used overseas to deal with the private militias that are often deployed with little accountability? Yeah, so one technology that I think is really interesting that was deployed, that was first invented overseas is called, uh, I write about it in the book, is called Persistent Surveillance Systems. I guess that's not a technology, that's the name of the company. The technology is they put a low res camera on drones and then set them to fly over an entire swath of the neighborhood as designated by police. And this technology was invented in Iraq to catch, in Fallujah to catch uh, militias leaving IEDs. So basically what it does is it catches the people who, it sees where the people who leave these bombs come from, it watches them put the bombs there and sees where they go. So it sort of gives police a time machine and a way to see where people are coming from, where people are going. So you can see how that's really effective at catching suspects. Now, it also, when used in an American city, subjects a whole lot of people to perpetual surveillance when they have not been suspected of a crime. Yeah. Um, so that raises some thorny constitutional questions. There's actually a case pending now, I think in the Fourth Circuit, that asks whether its use violates the First and Fourth Amendments. Um, Baltimore used it. Uh, at first, first they used it without telling anyone they were using it because they had private funding, so they didn't have to go to the city council. There's a huge outcry. They shut it down. But the founder of Persistent Surveillance Systems, Ross McNutt, did a lot of public outreach built public support for it. So I think they're bringing it back in Baltimore. Um, in St. Louis, the city council has recommended against it. I think that looks like it's gonna be permanent. They were thinking of deploying it too. I mean, so there are a couple of questions. Number one, there's the constitutional question regarding surveillance. There's also the question, these planes mostly fly during the day. And in Baltimore and St. Louis and cities with high crime rates, the crimes that are committed are often done at night and they're often interpersonal, meaning there's a sort of series of retaliatory gang-based attacks. Mm -hmm. The plane isn't really good at solving those crimes, both because they're committed at night and because I think the money that you spend for that would be better spent having a sort of gang unit embedded in the community that knows people there. St. Louis tried that in the early 2000s and brought, brought the crime rate down. So that's one instance of a battlefield technology coming home and I think not quite fitting police work. Let's see. The technology has improved. Can we hope that it becomes even better to the point of eliminating false negative and false positives? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can hope that it does, sure. I think that that we shouldn't base policy around hope. I think we should look at what it does now and look at especially at the at the at the bias rates of responses um, and look more importantly at how police want to use it. So, you know, facial recognition, in my view, 
is dangerous when it is ineffective because it might subject people to unnecessary contact with law enforcement. And it is dangerous when it's effective because it risks eroding, eliminating really our right to be anonymous and not tracked in public. So again, I don't think that's a reason to, I don't think that it's, it's politically plausible, feasible to push for a permanent outright ban. There are some cities and one state, Vermont, that have banned police from using facial recognition. I don't think that's going to work everywhere. I would much rather see laws in place like Massachusetts's, which allow for the use of facial recognition, which recognize that facial recognition has a tremendous upside, but also a huge downside. And so I think, you know, requiring a judge to sign off on it, requiring someone who's not the police to run the search, not letting police have the apps on their phones so they can do it whenever they want, those are all sound strategies regardless of, of even, those are sound strategies to use, I, sh I should say, even as the tech gets more and more effective. And I guess that's a slightly separate issue from just, you know, surveillance, right? I mean, yeah. the, the use of the face recognition is at the end point of having gathered all this data. So like yeah. I'm just walking around living my life. Do I want a drone? How do I feel? But a drone just circling endlessly, perpetual surveillance, right? Yeah. Or continuous surveillance, whatever that company is called. It's just so incredibly creepy. Yeah. Um, and, but what do I have to hide? <laughs> yeah. I think that's, a, I, that's a natural response. And that's a, that's a natural response. And I think, I think we have to sort of push past that now, in the case of persistent surveillance, I should say that the that the cameras they mount, as I said, are low res, which means that they can't see faces, they can't even see the sort of they can't see the race of the person they're watching. The cameras I've seen, I've seen, I've seen footage from it. The people are little dots, and the cars they get into are slightly bigger dots. Okay. And the only reason you know that a dot is a person, not a tree, is that the dot is moving. But there's nothing that prevents another company from putting high-res cameras on and flying the drones a little bit lower um, and storing data however long they want for whatever purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a very natural response to think, you know, I have nothing to hide. What am I worried about? But that doesn't mean that, you know, you won't get into a dispute with a vindictive police officer who could use this tech in a, in a malicious way. And right. so that's why, again, I think it's really, really important to have use policies and to have penalties that actually that actually have some teeth to them. Yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm dying to ask a question whether we should be and I'm going to whether we should be more afraid of state surveillance or corporate surveillance, right? Which is you don't probably write about that because that's not that uh, that you know that's not about justice strictly and liberty, but you know who should we be more afraid of? I think it's a great question. At the risk of prompting someone to promoting someone else's book other than mine, uh, Shoshana Zuboff wrote ah. a terrific book about corporate surveillance that is just, it's, 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 it's great. It's mind blowing. It'll make you cancel your grocery store loyalty cards. But I think there's enough, there's enough to worry about in both cases. And there's a lot to worry about in the interplay between them, right? You know, I think that I have a, I have a stop and shop savings card that I flash every time to go to the grocery store. As a result, that card knows a huge amount about my habits. It knows how, you know, do I eat healthy? You know, do I get enough fruits and vegetables? What happens when an insurance company demands access to that data? Well, if they won't demand it, what happens when an insurance company comes to me and says, hey, you know, we're gonna offer you a lower rate if you give us access to that data and show us you're being healthy. We're gonna offer you a lower rate if you let us monitor your step count so we can see that you're that you're that you're active. I think a lot of people will opt in, and over time, if that's the case, and those rates will become instead of instead of a bonus it'll become effective penalty for people who don't have it so i think there's a lot to worry about from both state and and corporate surveillance but i guess ostensibly or i don't know if that's the right word you have a choice right this you don't have a choice if the if the police drone is surveilling um i mean you can't i guess you can move to another city where you can immigrate but you know like the state seems like it's it doesn't leave you, it has the power to coerce in a way yes, that definitely. arguably, you know, a private company doesn't. So you could, in fact, just, you know, move on the middle of Idaho and, and have no internet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll consider that. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, lots of you, lots of us use 
fingerprints to log into our electronic devices. What will happen when someone's machine is hacked and their fingerprints, which can be changed, are now in the public domain? Yep. I use a code, not fingerprints and not facial recognition, to unlock my phone for exactly that reason. I worry about that. Um, it may be a small risk, but I don't want I don't want my fingerprints to be out in the public domain. I you know, I think they're I think I had to give my fingerprints when I when I worked a city job at some point years ago, but you know, I, I think that's still on paper. I worry about a digital copy of my fingerprints circulating online. What are the concerns with automatic license plate readers? Other than finding stolen cars or identifying vehicles involved in a crime, how is this data being used? So I write about that too in the book. And what an ALPR is, for, for those who may not know, is if, if it's one of these things you would never see unless you were looking for it. And then once you start looking for it, you see that they're everywhere. They're a small, flat, sort of rectangular camera slightly thicker and longer than a deck of plane cards that that are usually mounted on police cars and what they do is as the police cars drive they capture images of each license plate that they pass and translate that image into grayscale so just letters and numbers and state um, along with the geospatial data so where was this plate when did you see it the risk is that in cities in most cities and suburbs and places that don't have, I'm saying in places that don't have robust public transportation, those cameras can build a really granular portrait of our life. They can tell police where we went, where we go, where we're parked. They can, they can tell the state if we are going to AA meetings. They can tell the state if we're going to, you know, if, 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 if we're gambling, if we're maybe not home when we say we're going to be home, are we, are we, you know, unfaithful in our marriage, can tell the state all kinds of things. That data is stored. The fear is that that data is then stored for an often an indefinite amount of time, often in ways that aren't terribly secure. So I think in, in 2015, there was a journalist in Boston who found Boston's entire ALPR database online on an unsecured SERP. So what license plates were seen when? You can imagine what you can do with that sort of information. I think that there are there 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 are some policies you can set um, that reduce the harms. The one I like most is New Hampshire's, which requires that if it allows police to use ALPRs perpetually on perpetually recording uh, uh, license plates, but if a plate is captured that is not stolen or connected to a crime, that is the vast majority of them, then that plate has to be deleted from the system within three minutes. I think it's pretty reasonable. You know, I can, I guess, see the reason for 24 hours because you want to have some sort of retroactive capacity. But in that case, the harms from ALPRs, I think, are mitigated with really good, rigorous uh, storage policies. Okay. Do your concerns of surveilling states monitoring <clears throat> extend to monitoring or tracking guns and gun sales? Um, I mean, I, I, that's a good question. And I probably betray my bias here when I say that I'm, I'm, I would have no problem with a national gun database so we know who has what gun where, when they were used in a crime. Although I can just as strongly see the argument against it. I say my, my bias because I am not a gun owner. I think, that, I think that guns are a uniquely dangerous form of technology that should be controlled more strictly than they are, for better or worse. That's what I think. Well, thank you for, you know, thank you for being honest about your, you know, the bias, which we all have. Is there a mugshot facial recognition database like fingerprint database? Is there the potential for an iris recognition database? So that's a great question. Yes, there is. A lot of work is being done, not just on facial recognition, but the cutting edge stuff is on, uh, as you say, on, on iris recognition. What more useful for for police surveillance is is gait and body recognition. So that means there, the way you stand and walk and sort of carry yourself when you're standing still, those are all extremely unique. And so this is, I think, there's an Israeli firm that's really on the cutting edge here. These are ways of tracking you from the back, so they don't have to see your face. Um, as for the question about a mugshot database, those exist. Uh, I don't think there's one, I don't think there is a national mugshot database yet, 
but uh, mugshot and driver's license database exist. I think as of 2016, Georgetown Law put out a report that said half of all Americans have their faces either through driver's licenses, passports, or arrests available in FBI accessible databases. I suspect that with Clearview now on the scene, that share is much, much higher, but there are those databases. Mm -hmm. How are judges and court systems accepting facial recognition as evidence? Uh, well, in general, as I said in the in, when I read, the police generally use facial recognition as as a generated lead. So it's it's one lead among many. I think that they're required to tell the judge and defense attorneys. As in most jurisdictions, they have to reveal that they use facial recognition. I don't think they necessarily have to reveal where it was on the list, as I said in the in the reading, like whether they were the top search, the 45th search. But it's, you know, it's one part of evidence among many. It is not, to the best of my knowledge, it is not, courts haven't and won't accept it as conclusive, um, but it's used in determining sort of whether it's, it's in, in, in determining whether they have the right suspect. Mm -hmm. Everything is electronic now, purchases, banking, <coughs> social media, emails, phone calls, etc. Can we ever expect privacy in the midst of this? It's <laughs> just like I give up. <laughs> I know. Don't, don't give up. Don't give up. I understand the impulse to give up. I think there's a lot of 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 you know. I, I one of the one of the companies I saw in, I saw an ALPR maker in Israel, and I asked if if I asked an executive if they were worried about privacy, and the guy who I was talking to just held up his phone and said, "Look, you know, WhatsApp and Facebook are listening to us." They know where we go. Privacy is dead. I don't worry about it at all. I think that's exactly the wrong attitude. I think that there is significant, there is a significant erosion of privacy. I think that we are tracked much more than we were. That's just a fact. But if we take the view that privacy is dead, then privacy will be dead. That's why I think every single fight around privacy is, is worth having. Because maybe we will never get back the days where we could just wander around completely anonymous in public. We are going, CCTV cameras exist. Most of us have to have cell phones. Most of us are comfortable with a greater level of tracking than our parents and grandparents would have been. But you can't think that privacy is dead because that, that really will kill it. Mm -hmm. have, have surveys been done of, let's say, Americans uh, asking them, I don't know, questions around these technologies? Like, what, what's the public opinion like? I don't, know answer, I don't know the answer to that, but we do at the Economist. We have we have a pollster who will ask questions for us, and I'm planning to do something on this in the future. So I, I'd really love to know what the what the what the general opinion is. And of course, you they should definitely uh, divide the cohorts by age because you say the yeah. Uh, <laughs> It seems like the answer to much of this is increasing the bar on behalf of citizenry. Are there models for fighting surveillance state policies, stronger inspector general, third party bodies? I mean, I think you, you but tell us more about some tools for, yeah. Yeah, I mentioned the Oakland Privacy Commission. I think that's a really good model. I think that that's, that's a good model because it is citizen based and because it is proactive, right? It doesn't wait for an abuse to happen. It, it sort of forces the state to, to, to think about what it wants and explain to the public what it wants beforehand. Um, <clears throat> on the question of corporate surveillance, I think that the EU's directive, GDPR, general directive on private, I don't remember what it's saying. Anyway, the, the, the right to be forgotten, the fact that privacy there is, is opt out rather than opt in, that you have to make an affirmative ruling to allow a company to collect your data rather than what we have here in which case in which you know companies track us online and we have to go to a to a tremendous effort to prevent them from doing so um, i mean I, th I think those sorts of things as third party bodies i like the open privacy commission model as a sort of state law i think that privacy should be uh, opt out rather than opt in that is we should have a default toward privacy online um, whether that sort of EU regulation has hope here, I don't really know. I'd like to think it does, but I, I also think it's probably a fairly low federal priority. Do you have a view kind of more generally about regulation? This is sort of switching gears, but if you do about regulation of, of social media, um, 
you know, there's just much talk about it. And it's less about, at least on the surface, it's more about what content should be allowed and what content shouldn't be. Uh, but I mean, like, do you have a view on what kind of regulation, if any, there should be of social media? I mean, well, let me try to answer that in a couple ways. The mm -hmm. first is sort of the way that I looked at it in my book, which is a lot of police forces use social media monitoring software that just vacuums up enormous numbers of posts and makes aggregate judgment that would be impossible in an individual case, right? And I think on the one hand, I understand, I think people generally understand that social media is public and whatever you put out there can be seen by a lot of people. So, I mean, you'd be shocked the number of people who have been caught for criminal offenses because they posted evidence of themselves committing a crime. You probably shouldn't do that. But I think most people understand there's a qualitative difference between that and between, you know, if there's going to be a protest, police using this massive social media scraping software to see who's going where, where the protest is happening. You know, maybe there's a public safety justification for that in the same way that you want police out on the streets during a, during a protest. Um, but do you really want them monitoring what people are saying to each other, storing that data for as long as they want? I think that makes me a bit uneasy. Mm -hmm. I think if you're, I mean, if you're asking about, about, about sort of whether there should be a, whether the social media networks are basically common carriers, right? Whether they should have to be open to everyone. Yes. That is probably not. Um, you know, I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea. You know, Donald Trump's banning from Twitter was, I think, salutary in that it, it, it lowered the amount of disinformation. It objectively lowered the amount of disinformation being circulated. Um, it lowered the, the sort of political temperature in the country. The effects were good. I mean, I'm still deeply uneasy with the idea that one company can have that sort of effect and isn't answerable to anyone. Um, so in that case, I know it's no, you know, it, 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 I can see both sides of that argument. I think there are benefits to regulating social media, to regulating disinformation on social media, to banning, you know, that sort of disinformation from social media um, in the same way that, you know, if, 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 if you ran a restaurant and someone came in in Nazi regalia and started shouting that the Holocaust never happened and all sorts of anti-Semitic filth, you would not only have the right but the obligation to throw him out. I think that that's one way to look at, at social media monitoring disinformation. Like you can throw out obviously noxious speech. You know, does it make me a bit uncomfortable that these private Who companies- Who decides who is that noxious speech, right? What's who, that? Uh, who decides and do we trust that- That's the problem, right. Corporation right. decide what is noxious speech. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a problem. It's a it's a thorny problem. Yeah. All right. More questions. Um, has there been meaningful reform as a result of the Snowden revelations? Yeah. Well, I think that I think that the Oakland Privacy Commission emerged as a direct response to the Snowden revelations. I think that 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 in itself was a was a was a really salutary thing. Um, I think the Snowden regulation revelations made a lot of people just a lot more aware of the scale of surveillance. Um, one reason I chose the police to tell the story is that if I said the NSA is monitoring all of our email and 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 you know phone traffic, I think it would have been a big shrug. Like we knew that already. Mm -hmm. But the scale of those revelations, the scale of 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 surveillance rather that that the NSA did, police forces can basically do the same thing and those are much more intimate and local. So that was a way, I think that that, that, by, but that by showing how it's used by the police in your hometown, it makes this sort of the threat much more visceral than it otherwise would have. Um, but I think to the extent that, that the stone revelations made people more aware and more leery of state surveillance, that that's also good. What is the best case for opening the door on this technology? Well, the door has been opened. Like, what's the big win if we ignore all these many losses? I mean, I think the police would say that the big win is public safety. But, you know, as I said before, I think that is an incomplete metric. I think the downside is just too great to open the door without any, you know, too great to open the door without a bouncer or two. You know, you just want to know what's being used. 
what is being used? How are they using it? What are the penalties for misuse? Those sorts of questions. So I think it's not a it's not a it's not an open door shut door question. The door is open, but we just want to regulate what's happening. Are you aware of new emerging forms of surveillance that we should worry about? <laughs> I mean, I think increasingly accurate facial recognition. It's not entirely new, but it's there's a huge difference in an, in an accurate form and a non-accurate form. I mentioned. Um, gate recognition that just further expands or further erodes rather our right to be anonymous in public um those are the those are the big ones that 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 worry me most mm -hmm. after 9 11 there was the total information awareness program what is the status of that or its descendants i mean as far as i know it still exists in some form right we still fingerprint, if we're thinking about the same thing, we still fingerprint everyone coming into the United States. We still store their passport information. I think that's what total information awareness was. I'm not, I'm not entirely certain, but I think it still exists. <laughs> what, what is the author hiding about his shop and save card? <laughs> That's a good one. Really, <laughs> John. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I have been, I, I, I've been trying really, really hard to be a vegan as much as possible. I think that my stop and shop card will probably show that I've done a less good job than I should. I should say that in my defense, um, I cannot eat eggs or cheese. My wife doesn't like beans, and my kids don't like tofu or tempa. So that, like the Venn diagram of acceptable vegan meals just gets, just gets really small. And sometimes I will resort to uh, hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what are you working on? I mean, other than your day job, are you thinking of a new book or, or a new novel? I'm thinking about a new novel. Um, I'm spending a lot more time. My new, my new job is mostly editing rather than writing. And I just found that over the past decade when I was a correspondent, it was really, really difficult to summon the writing, some of the sort of energy for fiction after putting my writing energy into, into journalism. Now that I'm writing less often, I find that the sort of fiction gears have started turning again. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna see whether there's anything sort of, whether they're cranking anything out worthwhile. And what are you, what are you reading fiction wise? Maybe you could throw a few titles for, because we all have a lot of time to read. <laughs> Whenever we're not <laughs> watching Netflix. Anything um, good reading? I've been going back and trying to be a, a V.S. Naipaul completist. He's one of my favorite authors, um, and there are a bunch of novels I haven't read, so I just read uh, The Mystic Masseur and, and loved it. I'm kind of tempted to reread A Bend in the River and see if that's still, that's still my favorite of his books. Um, ah. I haven't been doing as much contemporary fiction as I should. Well, I think I'm maybe going to let you go at this point. You've been, you've, it's been wonderful to have this conversation and, and thank you for your time. And now I'm going to switch over to announcements. All right. Thank you so much. This is a great conversation. Thank you to everyone who, who spent Sunday morning here and for asking such great questions. It was wonderful. It was thank a pleasure. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't close this program with a quote from George Orwell's 1984. And I could use Big Brothers watching you. But instead, <laughs> or in addition, I will uh, give you the following quote. The choice for mankind lies between freedom and happiness. And for the great bulk of mankind, happiness is better. I want to thank John again. And thank you all for coming. And please join us for virtual coffee and have a great rest of the day.